Rub up your engines! The Tapia says, can low oil damage my car? I got a 2019 Civic 2 liter. I took it to Speedy Oil Change and drove it about 5,000 miles. When I checked it, I noticed it was low, so I drained it out, and it only had three and a half quarts, which is what the one and a half liter engine uses, but mine is a two liter and uses 5.8 quarts. Should I be worried that I incurred some damage? What you want to go by is just the dipstick. Now, I, if your oil pressure light didn't come on, you didn't get any kind of damage, the engine didn't make any noise. There's a lot of extra oil in a car. Sometimes you can drive your car with less than half of the oil that's supposed to be in it, and that's still enough that it pumps it and it doesn't do any damage. So I doubt if it didn't damage but what you want to do is go by the dipstick only after you change the oil and filter put in whatever you think it is go on the low side first then start it up turn it off let it sit for five minutes be in a flat level area do the dipstick and if it's on the top level that's fine if not fill it until it's on the top always go by the dipstick a lot of them are a full what the engine holds if you rebuild the engine but when you drain it sometimes you know only uh three and a half four quarts will come out so Always go by the dipstick. That is the important thing. Mustmex says, Scotty, is it necessary to clean the VVT solenoid on an Elantra 2015 with 70,000 miles? If you have any noise or problems, you definitely want to try that first. If you change your oil regularly and use good gasoline, you might not be having a problem at all. They get clogged up, right? Now, if you're the type of person who doesn't change your oil, like use full synthetic oil, change it every 5,000 miles, might be a good idea to take it out and clean it. Look inside. It's not that hard to get it out. You got a little screens in them, they can clog up with dirty oil, you might take it out and look if you're curious about it, especially if you hear any noises. But if you do change your oil normally and take care of it, you really don't have to worry about it. It's something that people who don't maintain their cars or get sludge, sludge will clog it up and then you'll start to have problems. That's why you change your oil in modern cars. They have all these complex solenoids, little holes, valves. They need clean oil. Dirty oil will make them act up. Bob Mason says, how long does oil last? I got a 99 Ford F-250 diesel with 56,000 miles on it. I didn't change the oil filter since 2017, but I only put 600 miles on it. Does oil go bad sitting? It's so expensive to change the oil because it has 15 quarts. Thanks. Well, you're supposed to change your oil once a year. Sediments and stuff builds up. It absorbs water and stuff. So definitely change it now. I mean, if you really aren't going to drive it 600 miles every six years, well, maybe change it every two or three years, but you've gone six years. You definitely want to change it. In normal driving, you change it every so many thousands of miles. You can go further than a diesel. You can go like 10 thousand miles in that diesel but you're supposed to change it once a year so I definitely would change it now I mean if you're going to drive it any kind of serious length of time because water can build up in the oil and stuff and then destroy your engine even though it's 15 quarts of oil beats buying another engine you only got 56,000 miles you want that engine to last forever and the way you're driving it it probably will with that short amount of mileage fireman 311 says my mother's got a 2013 Kia Optima with an overheating problem she was driving the radiator cap was off, so I added coolant, and then it didn't overheat. I followed her home. She said there was no heat. Then all of a sudden, there was some heat, but then there wasn't. Uh, I think it's a thermostat. Do you think it's the thermostat or air in the system? All right, well, one, the radiator cap was off, so all bets are off. If some idiot left the radiator cap off, it's going to bubble out, and you'll be low on coolant, and you'll get air in the system. I would advise first to fill it with coolant, get all the air out of the system, drive it around, see what happens. If that fixes it, some idiot just left the cap off. Now, from there, if it still has a problem, the first thing you do would be just change the thermostat. They're cheap. They cost like 10, 12 bucks. Replace the thermostat, see if that fixes. If it doesn't, there are dozens of things that could have gone wrong. And you would start by watching my video, How to Fix an Overheat car Scotty. Watch that on YouTube. You'll see every possible thing it could be, and it could be any of them. It's got to be one of them, but it could be any of those. You want to go through the whole thing, but first, get the air out of the system, fill it with coolant, put a new radiator cap on, and see what happens. And it might have just been some idiot was checking it, left the radiator cap off, and then the coolant just bubbled over. Jaden 292 says, I have hesitation in poor shifting. I have a 99 Silverado 1500. When it runs for a while, it hesitates in getting into third gear, and it tends to rev up 
around 40. I can just guarantee you what's wrong. I've worked on those things long after your transmission's going out. It's 99 Silverado, 1500. The trannies only last so long. That's the weakest point. I've seen so many Chevy Silverados that the engines are still going okay, but the transmission's crapped out. And yours is starting to crap out, especially when it starts accelerating at 40, revving itself up. Your transmission's just starting to go out. And you're saying, uh, getting in and out of third gear, you know, it's having a transmission problem and that's typical. Now in 99 the Silverado engines are much better than they are today. The engine's probably still in excellent shape. Probably doesn't burn any oil if you change the oil regularly. But the transmission is the weak point. You got to decide. See how much a remanufactured transmission costs to put in. If you're willing to spend that kind of money and the vehicle's not rotten because you're not up north with the salt, ate the frame, go ahead put another transmission in it. That would be a worthwhile thing to do because back in the day they were much better built than they are today. And and your transmission certainly worn out, but you could replace it and still have a vehicle that's still in good shape if it's not all rusted out. Teddy the Torque says, my Celica still rides rough after I replace the struts. I got a 97 Celica. I replaced the struts with KYB struts, the mounts, stabilizer bar links, ball joints, and other tie runs. I reuse the stock springs because they're in good condition. Now it's stiffer and it's not bouncy. But after I rode it for a day, it got worse. Now, here's the weird thing. If I jack it up and put it on four jack stands, where the wheels are hanging, then put it back down on the ground. It rides like new for about 15 to 20 miles. Then it gets worse and you feel every bump. What is wrong? Okay, well, I can just about guarantee you they didn't build the struts correctly because you say you let it sit and it stretches out on jacks, put it on the ground, then it goes 15, 20 miles, it starts riding rough again. The struts themselves, the strut assembly, which is basically a shock absorber inside the spring, right? And that was the part you bought from KYB. All it does is absorb shocks. When it's cold, if it's cheaply made, it still might work good, but once it heats up and gets hot, obviously it's not sealing correctly. Instead of absorbing the shocks, the fluid inside is just randomly bouncing around, not absorbing the shocks, and now it's bouncing again. You got bad Bad strut parts. That's the only thing that would make sense. Because once you drive in heat, every time you hit a bump, they're going up and down, up and down, up and down. They get hot enough. If they weren't made right, when they're hot, they start leaking internally. So you have to have gotten a bad one. If it sits there and it goes, but then after you drive it 15 minutes, it's gotten hot. You're going to have to take it all apart again. Sad but true. They don't make things like they used to, you know. I mean, I've had problems with so many different companies that years ago they made drug products. Now they make crappy products. You never know. And in your case, it's kind of obvious that you got bad struts because after driving it a while, it goes bad. And then when they cool down, it starts going again. That's, that's just the insides of the struts aren't right. You got bad ones when you bought them. Chevy 69 says, what car should I buy for frequent driving? I drive about 50,000 miles a year. What type of car is best to buy? Well, you're driving that many miles. You want to get good gas mileage because you're going to buy a lot of gasoline, right? And you want something that's going to last? I don't know what you want size-wise, right? But if you don't care about big, get a Toyota Corolla. I just bought one. He gets 49 miles a gallon in the thing, right? And they can last hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles. Now, maybe you want a little more comfort. In that case, I'd say get a Toyota Camry because I had a customer just bought a Toyota Camry. He's getting 40-something miles a gallon on a brand new one. It's got an automatic transmission, not a CVT. Those things can last and last and last, you know, depending on the size you want. And if you don't know, road test a Corolla, road test a Camry at a dealership. They let you road test them free to see if you what you like, what you're going to buy. And if you like either one of those, that's what I'd buy if I were you. It's a no-brainer that they can both last a really long time and get good gas mileage. Jack Christian says, only two wheels engage in my four-wheel drive. Got a 94 GMC Sierra 4x4. Only the front wheels engage in four-wheel drive. What could be my issue? I don't get traction when I'm plowing snow. You got a problem in your four-wheel drive system. Transfer case could have a problem. It's old as Hades. It's 94. Now, I'm assuming that you say it's in four-wheel drive. You put it in two-wheel drive, and then it works on the back wheels perfectly fine. Then you definitely have a problem with the transfer case assembly. Something's going on inside there, and you might have to get it rebuilt. That's an old thing. It's an awful lot of money you'd be putting into that thing. Scott65 says, been a subscriber for years. I live in the Appalachian Mountains of Quebec. I need a vehicle more capable than the snow. I've had Civics, but they're too low. What do you recommend? A 2021 cross truck with a six-speed manual or 217 RAV4 with a six-speed auto? All right. Well, that's a really good question. They're both good vehicles. Now, the cross track, the reason I'm saying that's a good vehicle is because it's a six speed manual. Now, if it would have been a cross track with an auto,
automatic versus a RAV4 with a six-speed auto, I would have said, oh, take the RAV4 for sure. But it's kind of a toss-up now because the weak points of the Subarus are their automatic transmissions. That one's a manual. I would say you could get either one. Road test them both and see which one you like better because they'll both last. Now, I mean, in my case, I'd have to get the RAV4 with a six-speed automatic because my wife doesn't drive a standard transmission and she'd be driving it all the time. She always drives a fancier vehicle. I drive the non-fancy one, so that's what I'd go for. But those road tests and pick whatever one you like driving. That's what I'd say on that. The Crosstrek is a little more rugged, off-roadish than the Rav4, so you know. You could probably get the Crosstrek a lot cheaper too. It'd look that, and if you get a lot cheaper, definitely go that route. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.